Masechet Baba Mesiyah Daf Nun He Gufa. We're going to back and analyze uh, one of the statements that we saw earlier. Amar Rabbi Yosho Ben Levi. Al Hekdesh Rishon Mosif Chomesh. Al Hekdesh Sheni and Mosif Chomesh. Let's say someone consecrates an animal. We'll call that animal A. And then he decides to transfer, to redeem that um, Kedusha from animal A to animal B. And then he decides to transfer it again from animal B to animal C. So we know the law that if you have something consecrated and you are going to redeem it or transfer it, then you have to add a fifth. However, Rabbi Yosheb ben Levi says that only applies to the transfer from A to B, but not from B to C. And let's add one more level, not from C to D either. Well, we're going to see why we need that extra level. Rava says, I have a source for Rabbi Yosheb ben Levi that the additional one-fifth surcharge only applies to going to, from going from the initial thing that was first consecrated, a person says, I'm consecrating, right, this, uh, it could be an item, it could be a, a piece of clothing, a vessel, whatever it is, um, only when they go from the initial item, we're calling that A, that he consecrated to B, then he has to add a fifth, but not later. How do you know that? From this pasuk that says, the one who consecrates um, uh, an item, uh, in this case a house, can uh, has to pay a fifth if he wants to redeem it. You see, only the one who consecrates has to pay a fifth. That's the initial consecrator, but not the one who copies. That's peace, one who associates. You know what? I want C to be like B, D to be like C. That's called a copy, a matpis, and that one, that person does not have to uh, add a fifth, only the initial uh, consecrator, meaning only when you go from A to B. So we have a, um, a Tana that recited the following Baraita in front of Rabbi El Azad. And he quoted the Pasuk, there's a Pasuk that comes right after Bechor. Uh, so right now, we're not going to, uh, we're not considering this connected to Bechor. But rather, let's think of a Behemah Tema, a non-kosher animal, a uh, pig, anything. And someone makes it consecrated. Obviously, this consecration will not be as a korban, but rather kedushat damim. Any, uh, um, even a kosher animal, you can consecrate it as a korban, or you can consecrate it just for its monetary value. You can consecrate anything that is worth anything for its monetary value. So, um, while a um, while an animal, a kosher animal, can be dedicated in either way, and either way, it can actually be given to the bet hamikdash, and if it's for a sacrifice, bet hamikdash will actually sacrifice it, or the Bet HaMikdash may use it. Maybe they need uh, an animal to be uh, to carry things around, and so they can use the animal also. A non-kosher animal will not end up actually being in the Bet HaMikdash, not so for a sacrifice, and not to be used in and of itself, but rather only for its value, so therefore it will have to be sold at some point. However, and even a non-kosher animal can carry kedusha. It can be kadosh. You can consecrate a pig. This consecrated pig can't use it, right? And then you can transfer that kedusha from one animal to another, A to B, B to C, C to D, and so on. And eventually you'll sell it for money. So the Pasuk says, uh, in this regard, Now you do have to add a fifth. So what do we see from this? This praita is a bit confusing, and we're going to clarify it in a minute. But the initial reading is, just like a non-kosher animal is unique in that, it has initial consecration, a person consecrated it, the animal A, and it all goes to Shamaim, meaning no, you can't benefit an, uh, from it. No, nobody can benefit at all from it. Its entire value will be do- donated to the Bet HaMikdash. If someone uses it for their, for their own purpose, they commit Me'ilah. So too, any uh, other item where it go- has its initial consecration and it's entirely, it goes to heaven, also there will be a law of Me'ilah in that. So it's saying we're going to derive one from this, from this source that here, you're Chayab Me'ilah if you use it to other similar th- cases where you're also Chayab Me'ilah. That seems to be the initial understanding. But we're going to reject this and see how, how it relates to the so Rabbi Lazar tells the bright tells the Patana who's reciting the Braita, I understand the criteria uh, uh, criteria of it being totally dedicated to heaven, right? That would come to exclude 
Kodashim Kalim is like a Shalamim offering, where part of it goes to Mizbeach, and part of it the owners themselves eat and enjoy. And so therefore, since the owners can enjoy some of it, if uh, if they use it, they are not liable to meila. So in that criteria it makes sense. Ella techilat ekdesh lemu utemai techilat ekdesh who to eat be meila sof ekdesh let be meila. But the other criterion that you said only something that's in the initial consecrated item A that you get meila if you use it. And what about B or C if I transfer the kedusha and I use it for myself? Then I'm not chayav meila. That does not not true. That doesn't make sense. So the the whole baraita. Uh, doesn't make sense the way we understood it. He says, oh, maybe I know what you meant. Maybe you meant regarding the law of adding one-fifth. And here's how you read the, the Baraita. We learn from a non-kosher animal that um, it's unique in that the initial consecration is A. And it's, an, it's something that's entirely dedicated and donated. And if you take it, you'd be commit me'ila. And in that case, you have to add a fifth if you go from A to B. So too, in all cases where it's an initial consecration, it's at item A, and it also has, it's also entirely donated, and it has me'ila in it, so too, you would have to um, give, uh, you have to have a fifth, add a fifth surcharge, that's if you go to A, a to B. But if it's not techila tekdesh, meaning like item B, item B was not, is not the initial origin of the hekdesh, it just copied A. So if you go from B to C or C to D, then you would not have to add a fifth. And so we see that this paraita uh, would support Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi, and that's what he says, right? This, you meant this to be like the Lord of Yoshua ben Levi, only the initial A to B, that you have to add a fifth surcharge? He says, yes, that's what I meant when I recited this paraita. Rav Ashe asks Ravina. You see, in that Braita, it mentioned uh, the uh, non kosher animal as being um, either the first thing consecrated or not. So he asks, um, a non kosher animal, so it can be the first thing consecrated, and how about a middle thing consecrated? Can it be something that's in the middle that's consecrated? Right? I can go from A to B. Um, with a non-kosher animal, can they go from B to C, from one right, and and add another level um, uh, uh, through that? Uh, after that, from to another non-kosher animal, and so he answers, right, and, and if so, why why say only techilatik dish? Um, and he says, uh, no, we use the word. Techilat um, dish just because it cannot be sofik dish. Um, a non-kosher animal cannot be the end point of consecration because that cannot actually be used in the Bet HaMikdash. It's going to have to be sold somewhere on the line, down the line. So yes, you can go from one non-kosher animal A to another non-kosher animal B, and from B to C another non-kosher animal, but eventually C to D, you're going to have to change it to money or something kosher, or something that the Bet HaMikdash can actually use. So it, can't, it can be the beginning, it can be in the middle, it can't be at the end. Now that we know that, here's the question. What about the fifth surcharge in the middle? So now that we understand uh, understand that a non-kosher animal can be one of the links in the middle, um, uh, and uh, it can be hekdesh, so why not say that we have to add a fifth surcharge in the middle also? In other words, so far I've been talking about that if it's first A to B, then you have to add, then you have to add a fifth. And if it's at the end, C to D, you don't have to. But what about B to C? What would you say? And so Ravina says, I think it's like the end. The middle is like the end. Just like at the end, C to D, you don't have to add a fifth. So to B to C, you do not add a fifth. Rav Zutra asks son of Mamri as Ravina, why? Why do you compare the middle B to C to the end C to D and say you don't have to add a, a fifth surcharge? Why don't you compare B to C to A to B and say that you have to add a fifth surcharge in the middle step also, just like at the beginning? He answered, it makes sense to compare the middle to the end, because in both of them, you are comparing something that is a copy to another thing that is a copy. Unlike A, which is the original, right? B to C is you're going from one copy to another, and C to D also you're going from one copy to another. So therefore, it makes sense to compare those, and both of those, you do not have to add a fifth surcharge. But we ask on that, Actually, maybe you could argue the opposite, that 
makes sense to compare the middle to the beginning. Um, and just like uh, so, um, the, this one, has, uh, there is another step after it, so too the other also has another step after it, C to D. Um, B to C has another step, if not the final, um, if not the final stop, and A to B also is also not the final stop, and so maybe anything that's not the final stop, you have to add a fifth. So you can compare it both ways. And the final, an uh, final answer and proof is, we're going to learn from the extra he, which and the, the methodology that we see the extra he means the first one. We learn from the korban how la korban tamid um, in the morning. Uh, that is the first thing that has to be. Done. You can't do any other sacrifice before korban tamid in the morning because it's called haola the one the one that's special means it's first. And so too in this pasuk it says ha temea and ha temea means that it's the first one only if it's the first animal here ha behema ha temea why not just say behema temea only if it's the first one a that was originally consecrated and you're moving from that to something else, then you have to add a fifth surcharge. But if it's already past that, if it's just a copy, even forever, you do not have to add a surcharge. Tanya kavate de Rabbi Yosho ben Levi. Para zo tachat para shel hekdesh. Talit zo tachat talit shel hekdesh hekdesho padui v'yad hekdesh ale aliona. We have a beraita that supports Rabbi Yosho ben Levi that you only add a surcharge from A to B and not afterwards. The beraita says, let's say. A person has a cow, then he consecrates it. And then, that's parasha like desh. And then he takes another cow, cow B, and he says, you know what, I want the kiddushah to transfer to the second one. Or, if it's a garment, same thing. He has a garment, that's like desh, and he wants to transfer the, the kiddushah to another garment. So, um, it, it works, right? It's, uh, it, the property is redeemed, and if you do that, the first one is not, and the second one is. And here's the main principle that we learned from here, that the uh, temple treasury has the upper upper hand. If the, let's say, B, the uh, Talit B, is worth more money than Talit A, it, it was worth uh, 5 and the next second was worth 10, the Bet HaMikdash takes all 10. And the other way around, if the first one was worth 10 and the second one was worth 5, it works. Right, the second one is consecrated, and then the um, the person who did it will have to also then pay an extra if I pay the difference. So the Bet Hamikdash gets the benefit in, in either direction. Para zo bechamesh shel im tachat para shel hekdesh talit zo bechamesh shel im tachat talit shel hekdesh hekdesh shop hadui al hekdesh rishon mosif chomesh al hekdesh sheni and mosif chomesh. Similar case, except this time one uh, specifies the amount. Of the of B, so this second a cow that's worth five will be instead of the first uh, uh, instead of cow A or talit uh, B. This talit that's right now chulin and worth five. I want the kedusha from talit A to transfer on to it. In that case, also it works. The kedusha uh, transfers even if it's more money. And here's the key for this one: for going from A to B, you have to add a fifth. It seems that the chidush is that you have to, have to add a fifth of the uh, of the designated amount, even if that amount is more than um, than A was worth. Still, since you designated that amount, you're going to have to pay a fifth of that amount. Um, and, but that only applies from A to B. It does not apply if you take that talit and then move the kedushah to yet another item uh, from B to C. Then you do not have to add a surcharge. Okay, there's a, m a number of uh, ways to interpret this this part of it, but the main point of it is that the surcharge only applies from going from A to B and not from B to C. The next Mishnah teaches overcharging or undercharging is a 4 out of 24, meaning 1 6. Now, we already know this from a previous Mishnah. Uh, the Gemara is going to ask why it's repeated here um, that you're not allowed to overcharge. If you overcharge that amount, then you, you return it. And um, if one claims uh, in a, a partial claim in court, um, so in order to be liable to give an oath that um, I paid part of it, but I, uh, I admit to part of it, but I deny part of it, and you make an oath on the part that you deny, uh, in order to require that oath, the entire claim has to be at least two kesef, two ma'a. Uh, the denial or the admission can be as little, little as a peruta, but it has to be about a claim, an initial claim of at least two ma'a. Hoda'a, in order to um, be required to give an oath on an admission, uh, that one has to pay a certain amount, it has to be at least one peruta. And now that, now that we mentioned a peruta, we mentioned five 
cases where uh, a peruta is involved. Chamesh peruta ten. Haodah shave peruta. Iba yisham et kadesh be shave peruta. Vanehne be shave peruta min haikdesh maal. Vamosesh shave peruta chayav lachriz. Vagozel chaviro shave peruta v'nishba alot yolichenu acharav. So one of the laws that was regarding Peruta is when we just mentioned. Peruta is the smallest denomination possible. So you can't value anything less than that. So if one makes an admission to uh, something that he owes, and it's less than a Peruta, he does not have to make an oath. And if someone wants to make do Kedushin, he has to use a coin or an item that's worth at least a Peruta. If someone takes something that is uh, sanctified and he uses a little bit for himself, if he takes less than a peruta, then he does not commit me'ilah. You have some food here, he just takes like one little grain, uh, less than a, less than that. But if it's more than a peruta, then he is liable to me'ilah. If someone finds an, a lost item and it's worth at least a, a peruta, then he has to go and announce that someone lost this item. But if it's worth less than a peruta, then you can just keep it. And if someone steals uh, something from someone else and it's worth a peruta and he, and he swears, no, I didn't steal it. And then he wants to make teshuva. He has to go return it to him. Even if he has to travel all the way far to Madai, he has to travel in order to give it to him. But if it's worth less than a peruta, then that is not required. That's the, that's the Mishnah. Gemara asks, Tanena hada zimna on arba kesef, me sim arba kesef, la se la shetut la mikach. Didn't we, uh, the first phrase of this Mishnah, we already learned in the previous Mishnah, where it says, Ona'a is uh, 4 out of 24, that's 1 6. So why is this Mishnah repeating it? And the answer is, it's not teaching anything new here regarding Ona'a, but it's quoting it so that we can add these other cases of regarding Modeb and Mixat and uh, someone who admits uh, that to owing something, and this is the other amount. It seems that there were oral traditions and that, that were pre-formulated. And so we already have one back there that talks about Ona'a. But here's another one. It's pre-formulated and it has these three things. So we're going to quote the entire thing, even though one of the three is redundant. We already said it, but still the other two are new. So we're going to quote the entire uh, that, that that entire oral tradition, and it's in the Mishnah. Hold on, but these other two items that you said are new are actually all, all also already in the Mishnah in Masechet Shavuot, where it says um, regarding oaths that are imposed by judges. If it's a ta'ana modebe mixat, he admitted to part of it, then it has to be the entire claim has to be at least two kesef to ma'a. And if it's an admission, it has to be at least one peruta. So we already know that also, really, so we could skip this entire Mishnah that we just read and we would know everything already. And the answer is no, we wouldn't know the end of it, right? It goes together. This is all one oral tradition altogether. And although we know all these three items, but then the continuation of five different laws that um that are related to one peruta we would not know so since we're quoting this part of it we quote the entire thing and as a whole now we ask how come the mishnah when it lists five laws that have a minimum of peruta how come it doesn't add also overcharging is also a peruta if if it listed that then we would uh, and it should list it so then we would learn that um, let's say I'm, I sell you a, an item that's only worth a piruta and a half, right? And I overcharge you. I overcharge you a six, but a six of a piruta and a half is less than a piruta. And so even though I charge the six over, but it's less than a piruta. So I should say, right, the minimum amount to be to violate on a in which you have all the consequences if you have to return the item is only if it's at least a piruta. How come it doesn't list that in the Mishnah? And Afkana says this teaches us that the minimum amount to be liable to Petu Ona'a is not a Peruta, but rather an Isar, which is eight Perutot. Um, so in fact, as if it's less than an Isar, uh, the overcharge, even if it's a sixth, it's not considered Ona'a. Nobody cares about it. And that's why it didn't list it. Levi disagrees with Rav Kana and he thinks that the minimum amount to be liable to Ona'a is in fact a peruta. 
And Levi, in his version of the Mishnah, he actually has a different list of five. And in his list, it starts with Ona'a is Piruta. So you see the hazard on, on his list. It also has Hoda'a, which we have also. That's how we started with this list is a Piruta. It also has Kiddushay kiddushe Isha, which we had as well on top. And it has theft. Uh, in order to steal something, has to be at least a Piruta. We had that in the Mishnah. And here this one has... Um, and in order for judges to adjudicate, adjudicate a case, it has to be worth at least one peruta. If I come and claim, he stole from me half a peruta, the judges don't take that case. So now, our, how come our Mishnah doesn't have this last item on Levi's list, that the judges will only adjudicate a case that if it's worth at least a um, a, uh, a peruta. Tana le gezel says, no, it already included that in gezel. Since a case of robbery um, uh, means uh, only a case that it's actually robbery, which is at least a peruta. And if it's less than the peruta, then it's not going to called robbery. So if we, we could learn from that also that uh, the judges are not going to adjudicate a case where there's no claim because there's no it's not called robbery if there's no if less than the piruta so they're not going to see the case for for that reason that's why um, Mishnah didn't mention that even though it agrees mila tane katane aveda and now we ask how come our Mishnah listed uh, robbery and also lost property isn't it basically the same thing if I don't give you back property that I should give you then I'm stealing it. Oh, we need both of these uh, to be mentioned because each of them has a chidush. Regarding stealing, if I steal something that's worth a peruta and I swear that I didn't steal it and then I want to make teshuvah, I have to return it and travel or even to madai to return it to you. That's a special law regarding gezel. And if it also has a special law that if I find something that's worth a peruta and then it get depreciates, um, I find a few grains or whatever, and then the price goes down and now it's worth less than the peruta, but if at the time that I found it. It was worth a peruta. I have to proclaim it and look for the and look for the owner, um, even if it uh, goes down afterwards. So I needed that also to teach that special law. How come he didn't mention the case of uh, lost property, that only if it's at least a peruta you have to return it? He says, oh, I included in robbery, because robbery is all monetary claims, including something that you're supposed to return, and you don't. That's, that's a subcategory of robbery. And so how come Levi included both uh, stealing and the convening of judges, right? We said above that for the Ar Mishnah, you can include all those in one. So why mention it as two separate things, right? If it's not stealing because less than a peruta, then what's the claim? You wouldn't have a adjudication either. No. Uh, Levi says we need that line regarding the adjudication of judges to exclude the opinion of Rav Katina. He said that the Betin has to attend to a case even if it's less than the Peruta. So we need specifically to mention that to, to, so everybody knows that we reject Rav Katina. We're going to come back to Rav Katina in a minute. Ve'levi, my ta'amah la'katani hekdesh. How come Levi didn't mention hekdesh? That was me'ila, and the Mishnah says, if you um, st- uh, use pers- have personal use from a peruta of hekdesh, then you're um, liable to me'ila. But it has to be at least a peruta. How come Levi didn't mention that? And the answer is, bechulin kamayre, bekadashim la kamayre. Levi would agree with that, but he's talking about cases that are non-sacred property. He's not dealing with cases of sacred property. Ela tanadidan, te kamayre bekodashim, nitne ma'aser bepruta. Okay, so our Mishnah that does mention Me'ila of Kodashim, once you're dealing with things that are holy, why does it not, why does it not mention Ma'asir also to say that if you have uh, Ma'asir Sheni produce um, and it's uh, worth less than the Peruta, then you don't have to deal with it, but more than the Peruta, then you have to uh, redeem it. Uh, or, or, or bring it bring it to, to Jerusalem or redeem it. So we're following the opinion that says if the one fifth surcharge is not a peruta, then you don't have to bring it at all, which means the minimum amount that you have to redeem is four pedutot. Because if you have four pedutot, then the surcharge will be one peruta. So that's the minimum amount. If you're um, redeeming 
three pidutot worth of produce, and the, then the surcharge is less than less than one piduta. So then you don't have to do it at all. So that's why the, this our Mishnah does not mention Maasishini, because the minimum is not one piduta, the minimum is four pidutot. Okay, then why not say that the minimum for a fifth surcharge is one peduta, the minimum amount that you have to re- redeem, ma'asesh, that you even can redeem, ma'asesh sheni, no, maybe you can with that other chizkiyah who said you added onto a previous coin. Okay, the minimum amount that you have to redeem is um, if the fifth is one peduta. So that's a peduta law, why not include that? Because Mishnah is talking about redeeming the principal amount and not not about the one-fifth surcharge. It's not dealing with cases of surcharges, but only with principal amounts. And that explains all the uh, the the choice of all the list of items in our Mishnah. Gufa Amarav Katina Betin is Kakina Filu the Pachot Mishave Peruta. Now going back to Rav Katina, who said that a Betin has to adjudicate every case, even if it's worth less than a Peruta, they have to take it. There is such a claim, even less than a Peruta. We have a challenge from a Brayta Mativ Rava Veta Shel Chatamina Kodesh Yeshalem the Rabot Pachot Mishave Peruta the Shabon the Kodesh Ina Val Lehejot La. Uh, Rav quotes his paraita, quoting a pasuk that says um, that anything that one sinned and took from consecrated money, one has to pay. And we learn from that pasuk that even if it's worth less than a peruta, if one stole from consecrated property, even less than a peruta, one has to return it. There is a claim. And so we can derive from this that only if it's a consecrated item, then yes, you have to pay less than, less, less than a peruta. But if it's a non-consecrated item, just interpersonal, then there is no claim for something less than a peruta. And the, and the betin does not have to adjudicate such a, such a case. So this is a braita against the Rav Katina. Ela iatmar hachi itmar amar Rav Katina. Imus keku betin leshave peruta gomrin afilu lepachot mishave peruta. Techilat adin va'inan peruta. Gemar adin la ba'inan peruta. Rather, if Rav Katina said a statement like this, it must be he said the following statement, that once a betin takes a case that's worth a shaveh peruta, then they have to finish off the case even if the item ends up going down in value. They're adjudicating an item of, um, you know, a cluster of grapes. That was uh, worth more than a peruta. The value of grapes went down, and now it's less than a peruta, so they complete the case. So uh, it just means that the beginning of the case, when when they start the case, has to be worth a peruta, but when they end the case, it doesn't necessarily have to be worth a peruta. And next, Mishnah, Hamisha, Chumshin, Hen, Eluhen, Haochel, Turma, Utmat, Maser, Utmat, Maser, Shel, Demai, Vachalav, Abikurim, Mosif, Homesh. There are five uh, cases or classes of cases where one has to pay a fifth. The first one is if a non Kohen eats Turma, or Turmat, Maser, that's what the, the Turmat, the Lvi, is supposed to give to the Kohen from his Maser, or Turmat, Maser of Demai. And this is going to be a curious one that the Gemara will talk about, because Demai is something that you one gets from an Ama'aditz, that probably they took Tiruma and Maaseh, but you're not sure, so Midoraita, you can eat it, Midira Banan, one has to take Tiruma and Maaseh. So this Tiruma and Maaseh is only um, holy Midira Banan, and yet someone, a non Kohen who eats it, has, still has to add a fifth. We'll talk about that more. And also Chala that is given to Kohen, and Bikurim that is given to Kohen, if a non Kohen eats any of these things, he has to pay it back and add a fifth. Someone who um, uh, uh, eats uh, the fourth year fruit, fourth year fruit and ma'asir sheni is kept by the owner but has to be brought to Jerusalem and eaten in Jerusalem. If he doesn't do that and he consumes it not in Jerusalem, um, then he has to pay back and add a fifth. If someone makes something hekdesh and then uh, redeems it, transfers the holiness from that original item to something else, he has to add a fifth, as we've been talking about. If someone t- t- makes personal use of something that is hekdesh, he has to add a fifth to the value that he pays back. And also, if someone steals from someone else and swears that he didn't steal it and then admits that in fact he did steal it, he has to pay the amount back plus one-fifth.
Gemara asks, Amar Rava, Kashya led Rabbi El Azar to the Mat Maser Shel Demai. Vechi Asu Chachamim Chizuk Lidibrahem Keshel Torah. So Rava says that Rabbi El Azar had a problem with to the Mat Maser of Demai. This is only prohibited midrabanan midoraita it's only demai so you can eat it the rabbis say well let's be careful so take to the matma said anyway and so now if someone eats that non kohen eats that to the matma said they have to pay back the amount and a fifth did the chachamim really make an enforcement on their words like the torah right that they bring the drabanan requirement and the penalty the same as a penalty for violating the oraita to the matma said the answer is that this this Mishnah must be the opinion of Rabbi Meir, who says in other cases and in general, that yes, the rabbis, when they make an enactment, they will reinforce it with the same penalties that the Torah requires. The if a messenger brings a get from outside of the land of Israel, brings it to Israel uh, to deliver from the husband to the wife, and he gives it to him, and he gives it to her, though the law is he has to say, This was written in front of me and signed in front of me. This is a rabbinic enactment to make sure that it was all uh, done properly, even outside the land of Israel, and it was brought here. So uh, the rabbis require, but it's only a rabbinic requirement on the Doraita level. Yes, of course, he has to deliver the get in order for it to be effective, but he does not have to say this phrase. So what if he did uh, deliver it without saying this phrase? Then the and then, then she gets remarried to a second husband based on that get. She has to leave that second husband. And if she had a child with the second husband, the child is considered a mamzer, which is quite extraordinary. Because on the Doraita level, the first marriage was uh, was done, was uh, severed by the get. And the second child should be totally fine. And because you went against a rabbinic enactment to say, we're going to give a Doraita type of penalty that and could declare a child to be a mamzer. Mamzer, Rimeir says, yes, we do that. Chachamim so no, that's going too far. On Doraita level, the second marriage is valid, as not adultery, and therefore we do not consider the second child Mamzer. Yes, of course, you should follow what Chachamim said, but the penalty is not going to be that great. What do you do if someone did violate the, the rabbinic law? Okay, it's so very simple. You take the get that he gave um, her back and give her to her again in front of two witnesses and say, In order to rectify the situation, even though it's after the fact that she already got remarried and has a child, so rectify it now so you fulfilled the, the, the Rabbanan, but Midoraita, she was divorced and leave the child alone. That's what Chachamim say. Well, Rabbi Meir, Mishum de Lo Amrina and La Befana and Ertam Fatan Ertab Yosif Avlad Mamzer in Vimir Tamed Amad Abham Nunam Shmede Ula, Omer Hayad Bim Eir, Kol Hamishane, Mimatbea Shetu Chamim Begitin, Yosif Avlad Mamzer, Kot Bim Eir. Just because he didn't say this phrase, um, uh, he should, he has, she has to get divorced from a second husband. She has to leave a second husband. And we could declare the child to be a Mamzer. And the answer is yes, Rabbi Meir follows his general rule um, uh, that Rav Homana explained in the name of Ula, that it would be Meir used to teach that anyone who changes from the coinage that the rabbis uh, uh, coined in Gitin, that you have to write the get exactly as they set forth, and you have to give it according to all the procedures, including saying the phrase that was written and signed in front of me. If one deviates from that, then they has, she has to leave a second husband, and if she has a child, for someone else, but not her first husband after that, then that child is declared to be a mamzer. Baruch Adonai Amen v'Amen.